Spaghetti. Okay. Spaghetti. Hi, welcome to video number 14 in Food Mechanic! In this video, we're going to be continuing along with section 5, and this is going to be the second and last video of section 5. So we'll look a little bit more at the concept of similitude in this one. And similitude comes from the root word of similar. So we're going to be looking at how do we figure out whether two things are similar or not. Specifically, like if we have a small scale model of something we want to test, for example, in a wind tunnel, how do we know if that's similar to the full scale model? And the measurements we take, how do we know whether those are similar and how do they translate to what the full scale vehicle is going to experience? And so this is a really powerful tool as well. So here's the breakdown of section five. So we looked at the power of dimensional analysis in the previous video. So we're going to start this video by talking about several of these very common dimensionless groupings that we use a lot in fluid mechanics. And then we're going to go on to the flow similarity and model studies where we look at exactly how you can use like smaller scale models to get an understanding of how the larger scale ones will behave. Then I'll show an example of that in another video for the drag force of wind on a weather balloon. So last time we looked at how powerful it can be to develop these dimensionless groupings and high parameters. We also figured out that we can most likely outrun a T-Rex. So continuing forward along that line here in section 5.4, what we're going to be doing is looking at significant dimensionless groups in fluid mechanics. So what these are, are the dimensionless groups that have already been established by non-dimensionalizing certain equations and looking at certain common problems that come up all the time in fluid mechanics. So for example, we've already looked at the Reynolds number quite a bit. The Reynolds number is one of the most important dimensionless groupings that we come across. So in this section, we're going to look at a few of the others. And oftentimes, th these give us a really good start point. So when we begin to tackle problems in fluid mechanics, a lot of times it makes sense to just calculate some of these dimensionless parameters to see what type of analysis to do or what types of equations to use. Okay, first thing we're going to look at is inertia. Inertia is extremely important in fluid mechanics and what inertia provides is it's generally the force by which we compare all the other forces that are acting in fluid mechanics. So we have sort of an intuitive sense about what inertia means. It's generally something like we think of that as like resistance to the change in the motion that a particle is undergoing. So basically it means that when you have a particle flowing it wants to continue to flow. Right, So once it's flowing, causing it to change direction or slow down or whatever, this is going to require us to exert forces on it. So basically we think of inertia as like the tendency that moving, moving molecules, flowing fluids, the tendency that they want to just keep flowing the direction they're already flowing in. It's summarized well by Newton's first law. And it's Newton's second law that helps us define how we would represent inertia. So if we look at Newton's second law, we realize again that force is generally mass times acceleration. So the net force that these particles in motion will have is represented by their mass times their acceleration. And we, we've realized now at this point of the chapter that it's the dimensions that become very important. So when we look at the dimensions on this, a mass times an acceleration is mass times length over time squared. So if we want to figure out the parameter that represents this force, what we're going to need, very similar to a Buckingham pie analysis here, is we're going to need to take the important parameters in our problem that will yield these dimensions. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, we know rho, v, and l are some of the most important parameters we have in fluid mechanics. So if we take those three, let's see if we can make dimensions of ml over time squared to represent our forces. Okay, how do we use these three guys to represent a force? So how are we going to represent this inertia force? We see we first need a density because that's the one that has the mass in it. To get the time squared on the bottom there, we're going to need velocity squared because that's the only one that has a time in it. Then we can just use length to make sure we have the correct units here. So we want to be left with one L on the top. The density leaves us with L cubed in the denominator, velocity L squared in the numerator. So we just have to cancel off the one L left in the denominator and give us an extra L on top. So that's L squared. Okay, so that's really our core force here. So the inertia force, that's the force that the fluid always experiences as it's flowing. So to figure out what these significant dimensionless groups are, now we're going to compare all the other forces we experience in the flow to this inertia force. So let's see what that looks like in this section below here. We're going to look at the comparison of all these important forces to this inertial force here. 
because ultimately what we're interested in, right, is how these forces that we either exert on the fluid or the fluid exerts, how that relates to the core inertia that the fluid experiences as it's moving along. Okay, so you'll notice here I haven't filled this section in. I want to walk through each of these forces, so we'll come up with them together because ultimately what I want you to see here is that this isn't really anything new or complex. This is taking what we know, what we already know from the course, and really just putting it into a form that makes sense to us. So we'll have sort of a ratio or, or a relationship of these forces to inertia now. So the first one is the viscous force. We've talked quite a bit about viscosity, where the viscous or shear stresses come from. So let's look at viscous force first. Okay, so as we've described quite a bit already in this course, those viscous forces come from the shear stresses. So when we represent a viscous force, that's going to be a shear stress times the area it's acting over. So that looks like this. Now we're going to go ahead and simplify that to the most basic parameters that we need to express a viscous force. So shear in Newtonian fluids, we know that can be written as the viscosity times the rate of deformation. Okay, now we build this from its core parameters, so that has to be proportional to, so du is a velocity, dy is a length scale, and the area is a length scale squared. So we just uh, simplify that. Okay, so we know then that mu VL, that's how we write a viscous force for these flows. We're interested in getting the ratio of the viscous forces to the inertial forces for our flows. So we can write that out as follows, knowing that inertia from above was rho V squared L squared. So we just sub that in and simplify. So that's a common one we've seen before, mu over rho VL. It's the inverse of the Reynolds number. And for now, we're just going to look at the forces, a comparison of the forces. And then below, we'll go ahead and discuss what names these have and how they're used. So let's move along to the next one, which is the pressure force, and see what that grouping looks like. Something we've seen also before is the pressure force. So we know the pressure force is going to be the delta P, so that pressure difference, multiplied by the area the pressure's acting over, right? OK, so the area is proportional to length squared. That's our pressure force. Now let's go ahead and look at the ratio again. We're interested in how the pressure forces compare to inertia and what that dimensionless grouping looks like. Okay, that one's delta P over rho V squared. So that's how we'd calculate the pressure to the inertia forces. Gravity is another very important one we've come across. So let's do gravity next. So I'll just ask the question here. By now, I think you can see the pattern we're forming. So see if you can come up with what this would be and how it compares to what it actually is. So gravity force is mg. So that's proportional to g. And then how we get our units of mass is we'll have to use density multiplied by length cubed to get the mass units. So g rho l cubed, that's our gravity force. Now let's write out what, how the comparison to inertia looks for gravity versus inertia. So g l over v squared. And we remember, again, that came up in our non-dimensionalization that we did earlier on the equations. So we know that GL over V squared grouping, that's indicative of how important gravity will be to whatever problem we're solving. Let's look at surface tension next. Surface tension is actually a line force. So that's sigma times L. So how does that compare to inertia? So these force ratios will come up again and again, and we've already seen they really help us determining in problems sort of how we know which forces are negligible or dominant or that sort of thing. So these come up a lot, and they've been named, generally named after the person who came up with them or a prominent person that worked on them. So we'll break down the next section into taking these specific groupings and look at the names we've already given them. And like I mentioned before, we've already experienced some of these. So let's look at these on a fresh slide here. Okay, so we first take, and we've seen this a number of times before, we take that viscous forces to inertia forces ratio, and that's called the Reynolds number. And what you really want to make sure you're getting from these expressions is that you know when you see the Reynolds number, what is it a ratio of? That is super critical. But as I mentioned, I'm not particularly good at memorization, nor do I feel that it's that important nowadays. So in looking at the Reynolds number, in looking at the terms in the Reynolds number, I do expect you to be able to figure out on your own what the ratio is. But if you look at that, so you see the viscous term on the bottom there, that's viscosity on the bottom. So you can figure out that this is a ratio of inertia forces to viscous forces. We're going to dive deep on this term in the next few chapters, but we generally want to be able to walk away with this knowing that, you know, a big Reynolds number indicates that inertia is dominating the viscosity, so not very viscous flows at all, whereas a very, very small Reynolds number will tend to be a viscous dominated flow, right? So that's the kind of thing that's really important to get here. 
One very important way we use this, we'll see this later in the course, is to figure out the transition between laminar and turbulent flows. And we'll see this in more detail. We could just make a quick note here that very large Reynolds numbers indicate turbulent flows. So the Euler number is the next one. What that is, is writing out the pressure forces over the inertia forces. Again, not too hard to see that. We have the pressure term on the top, so it's pressure forces over inertia forces. And generally what we use the Euler number for is when you're looking at a surface, you're looking at a local point on that surface, and you wanna see the pressure experienced by that surface. So calculating the Euler number over a surface we see it's relating that local pressure to that rho v squared, and we write half rho v squared on the bottom there. Because remember, with these dimensionless groupings, we can use the inverse, so we can flip the denominator and the numerator. We can multiply them by these factors, so this half term on the bottom. Because they're dimensionless, these manipulations won't change them. It's just what we're doing here is now that pressure ratio on the top and that half rho v squared on the bottom, that represents dynamic pressure. So it's giving us a more meaningful relationship to how that local pressure on the surface relates to the dynamic pressure that the flow experiences. Very similar number, the next one there, the cavitation number. So again, it's a pressure difference compared to the dynamic pressure. So that P minus PV on the top there, instead of comparing some local pressure we have on the surface, to say atmospheric pressure like you generally do with the Euler number. This is a very specific one. So the P in this case is the pressure in the flow and then the PV is the liquid vapor pressure. So we have to remember back to thermodynamics for PV here, that liquid vapor pressure is indicating the pressure at which point we're gonna get a phase change. So what P minus PV is telling us is that's a difference. So the bigger that term is, it means the farther away that the pressure of your flow is from the point at which it's gonna change phase. So as that P minus PV gets smaller and smaller and smaller, your pressure is becoming closer and closer to the point at which it's gonna change phase. This is really critical for things like pump. We use the cavitation number a lot in pump analysis because what cavitation means is cavitation is when you have an instantaneous change of phase. So if you have a liquid flowing, it'll all of a sudden turn to a gas and you'll get these little bubbles and they're very, very high energy bubbles because there's a lot of energy difference between liquid and gases. So it becomes extremely important to look at cavitation number in flows where we have a pressure drop to make sure we're not getting dangerously close to that phase change point. Because once those bubbles come and we have the high energy cavitation, that can start to rip things apart. It can rip our pumps apart and cause a lot of damage to equipment. So cavitation number is really important to tell us how far away we are from that uh, liquid vapor pressure point. Okay, so looking at the Froude number now, if we look above there, what that is is just a version of our gravity versus inertia ratio. And in this case, again, it's dimensionless. So as long as we manipulate the top and the bottom in the same way, it's fine. So if you take the square root of the gravity force and then invert it, you see you'll end up with the Froude number. And what Froude uncovered is when you're looking at this gravity force, what that's really important for is actually to determine the influence of surface waves. So how surface waves influence the drag on things like ships, for example. So the Froude number becomes very important in open channel flows and calculating the drag on ships, for example. So it's worth noting, we'll look at an example of this because it's very important in marine engineering to be able to calculate these things on ships. We don't cover it here in our mechanical engineering fluid mechanics course. So in more advanced fluid mechanics courses, they'll sometimes have a section on open channel flows. So look at it in a lot of detail, but obviously important to understand how the fruit number is used, you know, especially in case you do want to go on and pursue that type of design or engineering work. So finally, their Weber number, that's looking at basically capillary forces. So of course, in my research on surface tension driven flows, this is a very important number. You're basically looking at how those capillary driven forces, so like hydrophilic surfaces, things like paper or paper towels, where you have these hydrophilic fibers, how they're able to wick the fluid. So it's basically comparing that surface tension force, which is gonna pull the fluid through comparatively to the inertia forces to give us an idea of how much flow we're getting. So how dominant in the situation the capillary forces are. Again, a detailed analysis beyond the scope of this course, very important though to know, to be able to recognize what these numbers are for. And then finally, the Mach number, which we would have come across, I think even casually or in former courses, where we're basically looking at a, a non-dimensional velocity. And what, what we wanna see here is the ratio of the velocity to the speed of sound. So you know, a Mach number of one means we've hit the speed of sound and anything over that means we're at multiples of the speed of sound.
This actually is important in some of the problems we look at because if the velocity is too high, then you can have compressibility effects. You can also have things like shock waves that influence your problems. So fluids behave quite differently when you have high Mach numbers. Sort of like the best example of this is when you look at the nozzle on the end of a rocket, you'll actually have a, what's called a convergent divergent nozzle. So once you accelerate the velocity that's exiting the back of the rocket there, once you accelerate it up to the Mach number, it behaves so differently that you actually need to change the type of nozzle you're, you're using to make sure you continue to change those pressure forces into your velocity forces and continue to accelerate the flow. Where we'll see use of the Mach number mostly is to make sure that when we consider a flow to be incompressible, that's actually a valid assumption. So you've seen us use the incompressible simplification in almost every single chapter we've dealt with thus far. So this indicates to us another time we might be worried about compressibility effects is for very quickly moving flows. Okay, so now we're at section 5.5 where we're going to look at this similitude. So flow similarity and modeling work. And what we're going to be doing is using these dimensionless parameters here to figure out how exactly we can make scaled models, how exactly we can use the similarity that comes with simplifying our problems down to their dimensionless groupings, down to the minimum number of parameters we need to make it a lot more easy for us to design and to experimentally analyze the behavior, particularly the fluid mechanics behavior, so the forces that are generated on these objects by the fluids they're flowing in, and to be able to run some calculations on that. So this is a section that's very applicable in a practical sense. I've made a quick example that I've put in the following video of a very practical scenario. And you'll see it's pretty straightforward for me to come up with very relevant engineering problems when looking at this similarity section. So scaled models are really common in engineering, especially in fluid mechanics. And the reason for that is because it's so much more cost effective and easier to test a small scale version of what we're making rather than the full scale model. It's especially true when it's large, like an airplane. So I'll show a, a very brief clip I found of like the Boeing test center and how they test some of their aircraft. And I'll link to the longer clip below. And then I'll do the same thing for the Red Bull F1 team. They were testing a scaled model of their car and I'll put a link to the full one below. And then we'll talk about how, how as engineers are we able to take what we learned from the scaled model and apply that to our full scale model. It's the start of another day at the Wind Tunnel Model Shop in Seattle. They are in the midst of another groundbreaking program for the Boeing Company. This shop is where new airplanes physically enter the world. These small scale models will one day become full grown airplanes. So by the time it rolls out the door here, We've cut out a lot of time, we've cut out a lot of energy, saved a whole big ton of money for labor, materials, testing. They get to physically shape state-of-the-art aerodynamics. Take a look at a model wing cross-section. There's probably 60 or 80 tubes. Packed with carefully wired instrumentation tubing. But you'll notice how they're stacked in there so tightly and neatly. The tubing collects high fidelity data that engineers rely on to validate wind tunnel tests. Giving engineering a chance to actually see their ideas come to life. Okay, so first we need to discuss the three different kinds of similarity. So the first thing we need to make sure that we have is called geometric similarity. And that one's fairly straightforward, right? That's really just looking at the shape and the sizing. So like, for example, if you were working in a CAD model and you just said, hey, scale every single part of this model down, for example, to be half as large as it is or a third as large as it is, as long as you scaled everything relative to itself, you're just looking at miniaturizing the whole thing. So it says linear dimensions related by a constant scale factor. So just make sure in geometric similarity, it just means that the small version 
has the exact same ratios and shapes as the larger version. So it's just exactly a scaled down version. Okay, that's not too bad. Kinematic similarity is saying that the velocities, we're looking at the velocities now, so they have to be the same at corresponding points. So what that means is, for example, if you had like that uh, Red Bull car in your wind tunnel, you have to make sure the velocity flowing over the vehicle matches what the larger scale vehicle would see. So it has to be same direction, and it means it has to differ by a constant scale factor. So that, for example, means that the velocity, say, for example, flowing over the front wing of the car, you know, scaled to the velocity flowing over the top of the car. So the scale between those two would have to be the same. So this is a little more complex, a little more challenging than just the geometric similarity. We also have to keep in mind that to ensure the velocities are the same and they scale the same, sometimes you may end up speeding up the flow. We'll see this in the example. So if you make something smaller, you may need higher velocities to replicate the forces that a larger vehicle would see. Now the danger is if you're using faster velocities, you might be closer to the Mach number. Or for example, you might be at such high velocities that you've dropped your pressure down so much that now you're worried about cavitation effects. So in increasing these velocities in a wind tunnel, you generally are gonna have to watch things like the Mach number, like the cavitation number. You're gonna have to go back and check and make sure that you're not in danger of having compressibility effects or cavitation. Finally, dynamic similarity. So this is now looking at forces. That's what we mean by dynamic similarity. And what it means is you must have the identical types of forces. They have to be parallel and related in magnitude by a constant scale factor at all corresponding points. And this just means that your forces, right, that are, basically this is the thing you're calculating, right? So you have to make sure that all the forces that are acting on the vehicle, when you're in that scaled model in the wind tunnel, that those relate back identically to what the large scale full size vehicle is gonna experience which I think is somewhat self-explanatory, right? Like you wouldn't even bother running the model if you couldn't figure out the forces accurately. So the question then becomes, how do you do that? How do you ensure similarity? So as we've done throughout this chapter, let's use an example. I'm gonna explain here the basic idea of what we're gonna do when you're looking at a sphere. So in this case, it's gonna be a weather balloon. So I'll go over the basics here, but then as I've been doing, put the full example in a separate video that you can watch right after this. Okay, so we've looked at the drag forces over a smooth sphere. And so it's our responsibility then to figure out the drag forces on this sphere, but it's too large and complex to just take the whole, weather balloon and actually calculate out these forces. So what we're gonna do instead is build a scaled model. We're gonna build a tiny little balloon, throw that in our wind tunnel, let's say, and now we have to make sure when we set the conditions in the wind tunnel that we mimic exactly the same thing the sphere is experiencing, the full-sized weather balloon is experiencing. So we know there's only two parameters that matter when we're looking at the drag on a sphere. So we've got that written out in the first line here. We know drag force is gonna be a function of what we now know to be the Reynolds number. Okay, so I need dynamic similarity. I need the forces to be the same, right? I can make sure we have geometric similarity, just, you know, it's just a sphere. So I just need to make a smaller sphere and I've got geometric similarity. That, that one in this case is pretty simple, right? Kinematic similarity too. I'm, gonna, I'm definitely gonna to have to check you know, for compressibility and cavitation effects. But otherwise, I can be pretty sure that the velocities moving over this sphere are gonna be representative of what the larger scale sphere sees. Because there's nothing complex there that sort of blocks the flow or, or redirects the flow, it's just a sphere. So dynamic similarities where the importance, this, this is what really matters. So I know the drag force is only a function of the Reynolds number. So if I can ensure that the Reynolds number on the weather balloon, the full scale weather balloon, and the Reynolds number that I have in my scaled model, if those two are equal, then I have to have the same drag force behavior. Because remember, I know when I plot the drag force on a sphere, there's just one line, right? Drag force is only a function of Reynolds number. So if I get the Reynolds number equal, I'm gonna have that same drag force parameter. So that's what's written below here. You just equate the model to the prototype. This, this is a point of confusion for a lot of people in this class. So under prototype there, I'm gonna write actual because there's a lot of mix up using the words model and prototype. I mean, I would rather think prototype, instead of thinking prototype, think of the actual like full scaled version. Okay, so I just make sure my Reynolds numbers are equal. That's all we're writing here. The model one equals the actual one. Reynolds equals Reynolds. Then I can rest assured because I know I'm gonna be at that single value on my plot. And that guarantees me that my two drag force coefficients now, my these two parameters here are gonna be related. So whatever I calculate or I, I measure, sorry, in the wind tunnel on the model is gonna be representative of what the actual weather balloon's experiencing. 
Okay, so I'm going to do this example in the next video with all the numbers. I'll plug in all the numbers. We'll take a look at the plot and see exactly what I mean. So definitely be sure to check that out because I think the examples really help with our understanding for this material. Okay, so our next section is incomplete similarity. So what can happen in some cases is that it might not be possible to have similarity for all your different dimensionless parameters. Okay, so the first way we might have an incomplete similarity is, for example, when looking at the geometric effects. So when we go to section C, Six, we're going to see that the flows very close to these objects called boundary layer flows, they can matter quite a bit for certain shapes. So you'll notice we keep saying smooth sphere, smooth sphere, right? So the drag force on a sphere is actually a function of the boundary layer flow. So the surface roughness between your actual sphere and the scaled model of the sphere, those two things actually have to be the same to make sure you have true geometric similarity in your testing. We'll explore this a little more in section six. So for incomplete similarity, it's just important for us to note cases that we might have to have things we have to be careful of. So I'll just write here, write some summary that says, you know, for drag force on a sphere, uh, the relative surface roughness is, is something we have to keep into consideration. What can also happen, and the example we're going to look at is the case of this right now, is to get dynamic similarity, there might be a whole bunch of forces at play. So what happens is you're going to have several dimensionless groups, not necessarily like the sphere case where we only had the two, right? If you have several dimensionless groups that you have to match, you can end up with some conflicts. So I'll, I'll write that out here and then we'll look at this example. Okay, so let's check out what can happen. We're going to look at modeling the drag force on a ship surface. Okay, so to model the drag force on a ship's surface, we're going to need to have dynamic similarity. In this case, there's two main sets of forces that we're going to be concerned with, and that's the resistance due to the surface effects, so the wave resistance, and we get that with the Froude number. We also have the viscous effects like we normally have in fluid mechanics. That's represented by the Reynolds number. Okay, so to ensure that we have the dynamic similarity, we got to make sure the Froude numbers are equal and the Reynolds numbers are equal. So first things first, we write out the Froude numbers here. So the M represents model and P represents prototype. So think again of model as like the little ship, the small scaled model we're going to run in like a scaled down replica system. Let's see if I can show a video of that quickly here. And the P's represent prototype or like what we really mean there is actual, right? So the full scale ship, like the full scale prototype. So to make sure the two fruit numbers are equal, we've written them out there. Cancel off G's. Those, of course, are going to be equal. So it tells us that we'll have to have this relationship between the speeds VM over VP is going to relate to our length scale. And the length scale there is decided by however we decide to scale this model. So how much smaller the scale model is going to be than the full scale prototype. Okay, now we also have to make sure the Reynolds numbers are the same. To avoid confusion, just remember we're dealing with the kinematic viscosity there. So that's just simplified like this. Sometimes easier to use the kinematic viscosity because both mu and rho are fluid properties. Okay, so to make sure the Reynolds numbers are equal, We've already limited the velocities and the length scales to make the fruit number match. So the only thing left that we can scale is we have to scale the viscosity values for these fluids as shown here. And that's how we can make sure the Reynolds number is equal. So we go ahead and sub in our velocity relationship according to what the fruit number had. So we're putting this in here. Now we get the line below. So normally to scale these ships in a meaningful way, and run it in a lab, the scale we use is roughly 1 to 100. That means our viscosity ratio has to be 1 over 1,000. And if we look at a table, so the ship operates in water, so it means we're going to have to find a fluid for new M there that has 1 1,000th the viscosity of water. Now, if you look at a table, only mercury even has a viscosity value that's lower than water, but it's only lower by one order of magnitude. So what happens here is there, it's actually physically impossible, right? So it's physically impossible to have this model scale ship operate in a liquid with a viscosity that's one one thousandth out of water. So this is a case of incomplete similarity, right? There's no possible physical way that you can make the Reynolds number equal while at the exact same time making the two Froude numbers equal. But there's a really cool trick to get around this. So this, what they've shown below is some data that was uh, from the US Naval Academy for a one to 80 scale model ship. Now we know, we know we're still gonna have to be able to design ships. So 
The question now is what are the tricks we can use to get around this? Okay, so if we look at these two plots, and let's discuss these now because it's really slick what they actually do. So it turns out that it's actually fairly straightforward to calculate the viscous resistance. So you can use theory to predict a viscous resistance. All right, so what happens is when you run this little small ship in your lab, say in water, all you can measure is the total resistance, right? So you have no capability of pulling out all the different contributions to this resistance. You just measure one total resistance, right? So the drag on the ship as it moves through this fluid, and you're just going to get these square values here. But because you can calculate the viscous resistance, so all these little diamonds here, you can also plot those on the same plot. So you measure the square values, then you use theory to get all the diamond values. So then what ends up happening is you know that the total resistance, say for like a value right here, so the total resistance here, and then you subtract the viscous resistance there at that same point, so right here, now, once you subtract those two, the contribution that's left has to be the wave resistance. So therefore, you're able to use the theory and the measurement to actually figure out what the wave resistance on the ship actually is. Now, the second plot is really neat. So you take the wave resistance from the plot you just used the experimental analysis to figure out. So you basically take the wave resistance, which you know is going to match the full scale ship, and you plot that down here. Okay, now you can go ahead and calculate the viscous resistance again, but instead, in this case, you calculate it for the full scale ship. So now you know the wave resistance, you add that to the viscous resistance, you can get a prediction of the total resistance on the ship. So in spite of having incomplete similarity, we can still use these experiments in a really clever way with this trick here to actually figure out what the total resistance is. Because we end up really only needing to measure the resistance value to yield the wave resistance. The viscous resistance we can calculate fairly accurately. So that's a really neat way to do it. One other note here, as we mentioned, is you have to be careful that you have similarity in a lot of other ways too. So because there will be slightly different surface effects, what they do in this case to make sure the flow over the ship is the same is they actually create a roughness, like an artificial roughness. So it generates a more turbulent condition along the boat and in that way, they actually match the same way that the boat's conditions with the, the large scale boat, the full scale boat is going to experience versus the model boat. So because they know that from observation, they can make sure that they match the roughness on that boat to simulate the turbulence that the boat's experiencing. So that's sort of one extra layer you got to consider when you're running these experiments. Now at Ontario Tech University, we're really lucky because we have an incredible wind tunnel facility on our campus, which is the ACE Climatic Wind Tunnel. And it's a world-class facility that has complete climatic capabilities within a large-scale wind tunnel. One of the few places you can do climatic testing and you can rotate the angle that the vehicle faces the wind. So it's a really sophisticated tunnel. Also, it's very large. It can handle things like full-scale trucks, full-scale buses. And so we remember that there's a lot of trade-offs here. For people who don't have access to the same facility as us, it can be quite costly, quite expensive to try to run these wind tunnel tests. And it can also be very costly to build these small-scale models. So there tends to be a trade-off between things like the new rapid prototyping and 3D printing we can do versus like the cost of a really large-scale facility. Generally, the smaller ones are less expensive. In fact, in my lab, we've built a little tiny mini wind tunnel to do some small-scale experiments on. Also, we can take advantage of certain things like those ships, for example, right? Where you match where the theory does well versus where experiments does well. Matching can help to simplify the systems quite a bit. So it's worth keeping in mind, right? That these facilities are very costly and very specialized. We're very lucky to have access to this. So we need to keep in mind those trade-offs between the scaled models, the velocity restrictions that we have. It's really actually quite a fascinating and intricate problem you have as engineers, as designers, when you enter the modeling phase, when you finally have some tests you can run on your new uh, prototype designs to really figure out the best way to test this. And it can oftentimes be a very creative exercise, right? So you tend to get rewarded for being clever in thinking about these systems. So in summary, we talked about the important and very common dimensionless groupings we use commonly in fluid mechanics. So things like the Reynolds number, cavitation number, Froude number, exactly what the forces are that those numbers are describing. So we have a real sense for their physical meaning. And we looked at similarity. Similarity really taught us how we can generate small scale models to replicate the behavior that very larger scale systems will experience. 
how we make sure the forces are the same or, or how we correlate the forces that we measure when we're looking at a scaled model. We looked at incomplete similarity where it's not always possible to match all of the dimensionless groupings and what kind of tricks you can do. And then we closed with a discussion of uh, scale modeling, particularly with respect to wind tunnels. All right, so that's the end of video number 14 and the end of section five. And don't forget to watch the example video that goes along with this video. Bye!